Hey guys, it's Malls. Thanks so much for listening to Please Advise. Just a quick message before the show. Don't forget to subscribe on iTunes. It's super helpful for us and super helpful for you. You can also call 323-450-7408 to get your calls on the show. Again, 323-450-7408. Or email askpleaseadvise at gmail.com with your voice notes or emails. Thanks so much. Hey guys, hey guys, hey guys, it's Malls, and it's an episode live from my bed. It's actually not live at all. Um, guys, be checking people on their use of the word live. Bothers me a lot. A lot of people say live. It's not live. Live would be like, if I'm, as you're playing this, I'm speaking to you in that moment. The moment you're listening to that, I'm in my bed. A lot of people say live. It's not live. Wasn't live, never was live, never gonna be live. Um, so it's just please advise from my bed. I have the flu. We don't have a guest today except for this guy. That's our guest. Um, it's my dog who's annoyed with me. Um, yeah, I, uh, was going to try and record on Sunday. Uh, Saturday, Friday was Taylor Swift. I knew I was going to be hungover on Saturday. What I did not expect is that I would also wake up with the flu um, I know. Who am I? How have I gone from zero to busy Phillips in 30 seconds? Like I've gone from being pretty healthy, like never really getting sick to all of a sudden my sinuses don't work anymore. I have odd mouth sores that I developed in Japan, which is always great. I have one on each corner of and they switched corners. It started out on the right corner of my mouth. Now it's on the left corner and boy, does it hurt. Um, now I have what can only be the flu. Um, on Sunday, I, I didn't drink it all on Saturday. I just stayed in bed. I, I got a sandwich. I ate my sandwich, uh, slowly but surely. Um, and woke up again after taking a long nap on Saturday. Saturday night, I was feeling okay. Just my skin was cold. And then Sunday, I just was getting ready for, uh, the Lifetime podcast the next day. And I just was like, you know what, Molly? This is too important for you to phone this in. Like, it was that thing where beads of sweat were developing on my skin and my skin felt cold and the sweat felt hot. It was real bad. Uh, Cold sweats, some might call them. I'm going to go a little bit more descriptive than that. So I'm in my bed right now just trying to feel well because, first of all, I just, I can't keep showing up to these recordings not feeling well. It's just not good. Secondly, The lifetime stuff is so important to me just because it's such a limited run thing and requires so much of my personal ability, like my being awake and attentive. And, you know, it's not as if I'm not awake and attentive when I do please advise or something, but typically, you know, that's a little bit more formulaic. It doesn't rely on me having an outline. Um, I get to interact with a guest. Um, If not a guest, then Christina, um, someone who I'm just really best friends with. And Christina's always there. So with Lifetime, it's a little bit more difficult because I'm fully driving that ship. It's a little bit closer to Emotionally Broken Psychos, but Emotionally Broken Psychos is a little bit more of a just, you know, it flies by the seat of its pants week by week over there. It's all different. There's other shows. There's shows that balance out mine. With Lifetime, it's just. You guys don't know what I'm talking about. I also host a Lifetime podcast called Mother May I Sleep With Podcast. If you are new to this podcast because of that podcast or my favorite murder, or you've come over from emotionally broken psychos. Welcome. Um, yeah, I, uh, I am recording today's episode in bed. I haven't eaten anything yet today, which is bad. I drank some water. Can you guys believe that? I got to say that is a new exciting new development is that I'm actually so sick. I'm drinking water. Listen, That's water, honey. Okay. Yeah. Catch me. Catch me drinking water. See me drinking water every day. Girl. No, not every day. Like for the next three days, I'll drink water and then I'll just go back to being Victoria Beckham, who has only drank Diet Coke since the early 90s. Um, I don't drink Diet Coke anymore. Fine. I have like two a week. Fine. I used to only have them on vacation, but now I'm kind of having like one or two a week again. I don't want to talk about it. Listen. Christina has put together a wonderful email for me, but I want to answer a question that came into my DMs before that. I'm not going to spend too much time playing grab ass over here today just because I don't have anyone to play grab ass with, Um, but I am going to read um, a letter, uh, pardon me, a note that came into my um, DMs the other day, and it is from someone named 
Aim Brianne. And she wrote, Malls, I'm headed to Los Angeles on Sunday. First time there. What's the weather like right now? I don't trust the weather network due to being Canadian and they never get it right. I'm so nervous. I wish my traveling skills were up to par, but sadly, I'm a hillbilly who never leaves the bush. Help me. What do I pack? Ugh, I need a lorazepam stat. Honey, I need a lorazepam too. I'd love one if you're offering. Um, I wanted to answer this question because I feel like it's a question we kind of get occasionally and it might just be worth it to address it so that if it ever comes up again, um, you know, right now in Los Angeles, it is late May. Um, it's not exactly summer yet, but it's also not, um, really cold either. And by the way, for anyone who's like, oh, LA really cold. You try living here for 12 years. Okay. Your blood thins the fuck out. When I go home to Boston, I literally do not take my parka off. When I go to New York, I sit in my hotel room in my parka. Okay. It is impossible for me to get warm ever again. I am permanently slightly cold all the time till I die. I think probably sooner rather than later. Here's hoping. But what I drove home to her is that with LA, layers are the most important thing in the world because you could move from part of the town to the other part of the town. It takes, you know, 15 minutes to sometimes an hour. And the weather that you will experience is entirely different. So I live up on what I call the hill. On the hill up here, it's 10 degrees colder or 10 degrees hotter than it is at any given point anywhere else in LA, including the end of my driveway. So if you go all the way down to the end of the driveway, I will sometimes put on a sweater up here by the time I get to the end of my driveway. I'm peeling that shit off because I'm fucking hot. Glendale tends to run. I mean, like I'll wear like a long sleeve top, like a, you know, like one of those, like my St. Pablo shirt, like just like a long sleeve cotton t-shirt. I'll wear one of those around like Glendale fine. Then I'm going to the valley. I'm peeling that shit off. And I'm talking about 20 minutes from my house max. Then, you know, God forbid I wind up in Culver City. That might find me back in a long sleeve top. Jeans always, you know, I I said to this girl, don't forget this is a desert climate, honey. Okay. So we do have that thing where sometimes it'll be really fucking hot during the day. And because it's so hot during the day, the second that it's night, the chill really hits. I remember when we were at Two Broke Girls one year, um, we were recording until we were recording. We were filming until six o'clock in the morning and it was late April, but we all had parkas on like fur lined parkas, uh, not real fur, chill out, but like fur lined parkas. We were fucking freezing and it was still not enough. My hands like were barely holding onto the pencil. It was fucking cold. And that's in a valley studio lot where there's like lights and like there's heat from people moving around and shit like that. So I will say don't ever forget that Los Angeles is a desert and especially because you spend all day in the hot sun when it gets a little chilly out. A lot of times it would hit me on like my drive home, for example, from let's say I was in Santa Monica all day and it was like, you know, it's Santa Monica, it's breezy. But like by the time I would get on the 10, I'd be like shivering, needing the heat on my feet. So I wrote to her, I would pack a mixture of short and long sleeve, to be honest. I hope I'm not too late to answer you. I tend to run hot because or, or I tend to layer a lot because I run cold and the city uh, feels like it goes up or down 10 to 15 degrees, depending on where you are at any given moment. I said, I'll answer this question. I'll please advise tomorrow because I think it'll be helpful. Long story short, if you pack some sundresses and jeans and a light jacket and a sweatshirt and T-shirts, you will be good. Now, this is important. I think you guys should just know this. It's very casual here, dressy casual. I think jeans and a cute and cute sandals and a well-structured t-shirt is the way to go. And then this is this is the real, this is the this is the hot tip. Also, I don't know what shopping is like where you are, but I always travel and then regret buying anything in LA because our clothing is not that remarkable. I wouldn't plan on doing a lot of shopping if I were you. I would save that for the internet. And if you go to New York or a city like Portland or Austin that has unique finds, cheap stuff in LA is really cheaply made and expensive stuff costs major money. So, oh God, I have no, she goes, what's the smoking situation on Laguna Beach? I have no idea. (laughs) What? But anyway, this is something that I really want to tell people about LA because it bums me out when people are like, I want to go shopping in LA. No, you don't. No, you don't. Um, I'm not sure where you're from, but you have the internet. If you have this podcast, you have the internet. And the good thing about that is that you have the world at your fingertips. 
Um, there's nothing that we have here that you can't find for better or cheaper online. Um, what I mean by that is this, like you might go to Melrose and let's say you want your Melrose fashion shopping moment. If you go to Melrose, I would say the thing you treat yourself to is like one of those $16 juices or something like that. That's the kind of thing I would treat myself to if I were you. But a lot of those boutiques, you go into all those different shops and they have the same stuff, like literally the same dress. I don't know who they're all buying their their stuff from, but whatever person that like, you know, sells dresses to cheapo stores is selling them all to the ones on Melrose. And you might look at it and think the same way I did when I was younger or whatever, like didn't really understand like how quickly just like I blow through clothing when it's cheap. Um, And like, and I'm talking like two or three wears, like, especially if you're a person like me that really like tends to launder their stuff um, for better or worse. Like I can't help it. I am always sticking things, even if they're just like slightly worn into the washing machine again, because I smoke and I have a dog and everything's always covered in fur and I don't want to smell like cigs when I leave the house. Like it's, I'm always throwing things in the washing machine and like, you know, you might get one wear if you, if you launder like me, you might get one wear out of some of this stuff, but it's very, very inexpensive material. It's very, very poorly sewn together. It's really a dime a dozen when you think about it. A lot of times you buy something in one of those stores and you'll be seeing that fabric for years. Like sometimes I'll be watching a Netflix show and I'm like, why does, or Lifetime is where it happens a lot, a Lifetime movie. And I'll be like, my God, why is that girl wearing the same material as my t-shirt from 10 years ago, except it's a totally different dress? I'm just telling you, it's not the it's not the best made stuff. And then when you get to the more pricey stuff in LA, you find yourself at Fred Siegel or you find find yourself like, you know, at sort of a higher end boutique. Um, you know, I would say sometimes the main exception would be maybe like a boutique in Silver Lake or something where you're finding more um like artisanal shit, like stuff that's been made locally or whatever. Um, that That is an exception, but you can also find that stuff online a lot of times. And by the time it's online, it's on sale. Um, and so I really do recommend to people, if you come to LA, don't plan on clothing shopping here. It's just not, we're not innovative with clothing necessarily. It's all a lot of the same stuff. I think you're way more like likely to find something interesting and even San Francisco, which is a city I'm not a big fan of Oakland, probably you'd find more interesting stuff, Portland for sure, Austin, 100%. But really it's New York that always drives home to me how much of a waste every piece of every item of clothing I've ever bought in Los Angeles really is. Um, because it's just, it's just so much better there. There's so much more volume and unique stuff and styles hit the East coast first. And you just kind of wind up being like, fuck, like, I guess I wasted all the money I spent on clothing this year, period. Like none of it was worth it compared to any of this stuff I could get in New York. Even just like stuff like hoodies, I would always find at H&M. Like I'd go to H&M in or Uniqlo in New York and find such better like hoodies and t-shirts and all that stuff at like their versions of H&M, their H&Ms as opposed to out here. Um, don't clothing shop in LA. It's just really not worth it. There's nothing you can find here that you can't find online or somewhere else better. Um, but yeah, just remember that LA is very cash. No, no real need to dress up. Always. I always say though, you know, our version here of, of nice tends to be more structured. So I would say if you're going to wear a t-shirt or whatever, in order to avoid looking sloppy, like, you know, either do like a really well-fitted short or a really nice like skinny jean and kind of like a bigger top or if you're wearing just regular jeans or whatever a really structured cute top like it and like just like a well-fitting t-shirt I should say I don't know if a structured t-shirt really exists um but yeah that was just something I wanted to answer off the top get it out of the way um I thought that was interesting because I was like while well, I'm writing it out I'm like you know what I should just share this with the peeps with my peeps I am going to get into the calls in a second. I have to go pee. Wags is also hitting me. Um, Wags, are you my special guest today? <laughs> my special guest? <laughs> you think that makes me feel good? That doesn't make me feel good. Okay. Well, anyway, we'll be right back. And then when I'm back, I'm going to be answering your calls. Hey, Halls. Christina, guest, if you have one, and Wags. Okay, so last year I was dating this guy for about 
uh, like three months. And from the jump, there were like red flags, but I kept making excuses for him, whatever. So I called it off after three months. However, one of the last times we went out, we, it was late, 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 super late. And I wanted to eat, so we just went to Chili's really quick. Um, the tab ended up coming to like $50 because he ordered a couple drinks. And anyways, on the tables, they have this little like device that you can like, come, like, you can like check out and leave a tip on it. So I was seeing what he was leaving and he was leaving a $2 tip for a $50 tab. And I was, I was, I don't know, I was a little taken aback. And that was for me kind of the straw that broke the camel's back. I um, had been planning on breaking up with him anyways. And um, I just, I needed some time to like gather my thoughts and, um, and kind of, I don't know, just, find the right time. And then that was just kind of confirmation for me. Like, I can't do this. If, if you go out to eat or if you request a service from someone and you leave, and you leave a, a, a lousy tip, I just, I can't tolerate that. And I think that says a lot about someone's character. Anyway, the point is, <clears throat> I was catching up with a friend last week. I explained all of that to her and she got so offended that um, I was offended by his tip. And she thinks that's the main reason I broke up with him. It's not. That just kind of did it in for me. But anyways, she got really, really offended. And I just don't know, like, what I can say to her to say, like, I don't know why you find issue with this. If you're in agreement with him that he doesn't have to leave, like, a good tip. I don't know. I don't know. Just the point is, I believe in tipping well. If, if someone doesn't, I take offense to that. So, anyways, do you think it's petty that I found that opportunity to just finally call it off? Because I did it, like, when you dropped me off at home when we were done. Uh, Anyway, sorry I rambled. Please advise. Thank you. Bitch, fuck no. Fuck no. If I were you, I would have reached up, grabbed the planet Saturn, and shoved it up my friend's ass if she judged me for that. First of all... If things were going swimmingly with a guy and I, and I saw that he left, I don't even know what percent that is. What is that? That's like, what? What is that? $2 on $50. What is that? 4%? I don't, I can't do math. That is a really bad percent. That is an, an insult. That's really, really insulting. And, you know, and there are people out there who have said things to me like, you're classist for saying that. No, I'm not. No, I'm not. Because stay home and have a meal. That's okay. Do you know that? It's okay to stay home and have a meal. It's okay for me to tell you to stay home and have a meal. If you can't afford a meal, don't go out. There have been plenty nights in my life where I don't go out. In fact, no one's entitled to a meal out. We are all entitled to stay our asses at home and eat dinner at home like we did in the 1980s. And you are not fucking... No. No one is... A blight. Uh, this is just what is it? What obligate? No one is entitled to a night out of the house to have a meal. Now the rules of eating at a restaurant. Granted, yes. Tip is my mom always say in the restaurant, and this is not exactly. It's to ensure promptness. T T I P. It's not the right insure, but yes, that's what they say in the restaurant industry. You are taught when you are a waitress that a tip is a tip. Um, but in many states, um including the one I was a waitress in, you know, we made $2 and 35 cents an hour. We didn't make minimum wage. We didn't make a nice hourly wage. We made $2 and 35 cents an hour because it was supposed to be just expected of us to be making a decent amount of money in tips. So there's plenty of states that still do that. And if you don't make enough money in tips, then you basically get cashed out at minimum wage. The restaurant has to make it up to you and give you a little bit of extra money in your check so that you are at least making minimum wage. And there have been days where when I was waitressing, I would walk out of a lunch shift making $6 an hour after waking up, ironing my shirt, putting on my tie, taking the subway into the city from school, working for three or no, working for like six hours at a steak restaurant, then going home having made $6 an hour the entire day. Now that fucking sucks. Um, There are a lot of things that people could say, well, it's Chili's. Well, you know what? No, it's still a fucking job. You, I would have dumped that guy if things were going very, very well. Let's say if things were going very, very well, not only did you 
do the right thing by breaking up with this guy you already didn't like. But all this did was prove to you that this was just not going to work for you long term. It just wasn't. And I really would I would I would take umbrage with your friend's opinion because to me that implies that she thinks that there was something okay about what he did. Um and if she really is so simple that she thinks that you're judging his financial situation or whatever else because you are, you take umbrage with him leaving such a sh- a shit just a paltry little like just might might as well have thrown a couple pennies at her as he walked out the door. That might have been better because then at least she wouldn't have to take two dollars from the register and that wouldn't be on her taxes. You know what I'm saying? That is so fucking rude. That is so fucking rude. It's so rude. It's not right. It's not right. And, you know, I would really I would reevaluate your friendship with this girl, too, because that implies a lot of stuff about one, her understanding of the world two, her moral compass, three, what she thinks she deserves and what she thinks she you know, like what, what she thinks she deserves in life. Like literally a person who looks at a situation like that and sides with the guy and doesn't immediately go to the waitress and thinks like, you know what, how is she going to pay? What if that's a mother? What if that's a single mom? You know, what if that's anyone? What if that's a girl putting herself through college? What if that's a father? What if that's, you know, she has to tip out the bartender. She has to tip out the host. You have to tip people out when you work at a restaurant. You're not just you're not just getting your tips and going home. When you're a waitress, you actually give portions of your tip to other people in the restaurant. Your bussers, you have to tip out a lot of people as a as a waitress. So that $2 was actually probably more like 50 cents for her. And you did the exact right thing. That is appalling that he did that. If I were you, I would have literally left $10 and said, you know what, if you're not going to do what I am. Because it's just not okay. And anyone who says that that's okay is not a good person. That's not a person that you want around you in your life because they think that they deserve so little. They think so little of others that they deserve that. And that's something that they would do to you. I I hope that this girl and that guy go find each other because it sounds like they deserve each other. You did the right thing. You're a good person. I fucking love Chili's. There's not one for like another like half an hour to 45 minutes outside of the city. I would absolutely go to Chili's if I could. I'm jealous of you for that. Fuck this girl. Fuck that guy. These people are not your friends. They are not good people. I do not like them. I do not want them in your life. I am upset. I am hurt. I am angry. And it's not okay. I think you did the right thing. I really tell that girl to call me. The one that was upset. Tell her to call me. And if she has any questions, I'd be happy to help her figure some stuff out because she's got her priorities all out of whack. Wagon stuff's upset. I'm upset. Wags, you upset? <laughs> That's how I feel, Wags. That's exactly how I feel as well. So we're not big fans here. We love you, though. Thank you for doing the right thing and standing up for yourself by not dating this guy anymore. Stop fucking guys like that, everyone. Hey, guys, please advise nation. If you're fucking someone who acts like that, stop. How about that? And also, I wish Christina was here because I know Christina feels very strongly about this, especially as a woman of color. She says that oftentimes she over tips because the last thing she wants is to have a reputation for being cheap. That's often something that is put on people of color. It's like, oh, they're going to tip less. Like, oh, they're cheap. Like, oh, you know what? No, it's not fair. It's not cool. It's not right. Christina, if you want to say anything, you can add it in here and post. If not, don't worry about it. I think I spoke for you just then. Not that I try and usually do that. I don't really like to do that usually. But, um, yeah, no, fuck that. Fuck this. Fuck that. Fuck all these people except for you. You rule. And if I were you and I ever go back to that Chili's, I would see that waitress and I would slide her a 10 spot and I would say, I'm sorry, I was dating a tacky person and he fucking did you dirty. And I apologize for that, ma'am. And that's it. Thank you for calling. I'm going to take our next call. And then I think we're going to do a letter. All right. Hi, Mom. My name's Haley. Um, sorry for kind of loud and walking into the subway but I'm just calling to get your advice on a certain situation um I just moved to New York last summer and in October my boyfriend moved up here with me from Charleston South Carolina where we used to live and um now we live together in this tiny apartment with three other roommates and I love him. He's great, but I can't seem to get any time alone. He goes to work at the same time as me. 
or later and then gets back home before I do. Um, so <laughs> there's just no room or time for me to be in my room and my space alone, and that's super important to me. And um, other than that, like today he found an empty food wrapper and just like asked me when I ate it, where I ate it, where I got it, and why. And I was like, why are you questioning me on this? And he was just like, well, I'm just confused as to why I didn't see you eating this. And it's just like, I'm about to explode. So do you have any advice on maybe something I could say to him that might not hurt his feelings or what? I don't know. The stakes are kind of high because it, he moved here for me. So I don't know. Please help. Love you, Mom. Bye. All right. I'm going to re-listen to this and just make sure I got this straight because I this is so problematic for me. Hold on. Okay. I got it. So – I'm confused because the I didn't see you eating it thing freaks me out because it's like, is he accusing you of someone else eating it? Like maybe you have some guy over that's eating snacks with you. And then because like as if that's what two people alone in an apartment would do um, behind their boyfriend's back. I don't know what he's really accusing you of. And that's, I think, the main thing that has me a little bit twisty here because it's like. I don't know. You also sound very young and you're new to a big city and you're living with this boyfriend who I assume you did not live with before because you sound like basically like you guys are figuring out living together patterns, like what that really looks like when you're living with someone as opposed to, you know, just like spending a few nights a week together. It really is crazy how like you can literally be at your boyfriend's house five nights a week, like, but you're not living with him. So the change that happens, even though you spend all your time together, your waking hours, it seems like maybe going to each other's places when you're not living together. Once you're living together, there's a whole new tone. There's a whole new everything. And um, it seems to me like that's what you're experiencing right now is this new this new tone, you're really finding out who this guy is. And it doesn't help the fact that you're finding out in a new city when you guys are both, hopefully he's working as well. He is. Yeah. You said, uh, working new jobs, um, you know, relatively new, um, you're both, you know, probably scraping by, um, you're living in a, a small apartment in New York. It's a very condensed space to be figuring out this person that you're with. Now, do I see you guys going the distance. I'm not really sure because it seems like you guys are having some really like some pretty elementary conversations that should if you guys were a better communicating couple, these conversations wouldn't be happening. Do you know what I'm saying? Like he would know that you leave rappers around and he would not only accept that about you, but he would not feel the need to confront you about it. Um you know, could you do a better job of maybe not leaving rappers around knowing that that's going to annoy him? Sure. Um, but rappers are going to get left around. If you're like me, like, you know, sometimes, you know, you're just like, oh, okay, now I'm going to go over here now. And, you know, behind you, you've left, you know, three dirty cups, a couple loose pencils, maybe a wrapper and a towel. Um, and that's, that's definitely how I live. And I would say that most of the guys I've been in relationships with, I've either over I've either overcompensated by trying to be the neatest person possible, which eventually drove me crazy because it was so far outside of my personality, like to the point where I would clean up after both of us, um, which is not I mean, not even my personality to clean up after myself, to be totally frank with you. Um, so that was like a version of me. But then there's also been versions of me where you know, I've had no respect for the person I've been with, um, you know, li not even living together. I've only lived with one boyfriend and that's definitely for a reason. I think that living with someone, especially a romantic partner, I mean, I would say, you know, let's not even say someone because with a different roommate, the stakes are completely different. Living with a romantic partner is really fucking serious. And I see why people kind of get into these situations, especially in cities like New York and L.A., because it's so fucking expensive. The rent is so pricey. And, 
you know, a lot of times it's like this relationship's going well. Like, I don't want to sign another year lease. Like, who knows what's going to happen in a year? Maybe we want to be together forever, you know, and just decide to get engaged or something. I'm a big believer in like, I'm not I'm not moving anyone into this house until I'm pretty sure I'm going to marry them or engaged. Like, that's just what it is. Like, it has to be probably even engaged because it's such a huge commitment to hand over a portion of your space to another person. It's such an intimate thing. You guys have to know the ins and outs of one another in such a real way in order to do that. But I can't go back and tell young you, you on the other side of a year, year ago, um, I can't tell you to not do this. Um, so here's where we are. I think the first thing that you have to say is, you know, he's probably feeling not dissimilar to you and that it's a little bit cramped in there. Um, you feel a little bit claustrophobic with just the amount of togetherness you guys are experiencing. And I, I'm sure that if you came to him and said like, listen, like, you know, I think that we should have nights where we kind of give each other a break to have space in the apartment. What that means, what that looks like, whether that's, you know, you spend a couple nights of the week, maybe going to the library, going to a coffee shop, meeting up with a friend, like doing something that purposefully gets you out of the house. Um, I think that could be smart. And And you know what comes along with that right away? My mind goes to what an amazing opportunity for you to really challenge yourself to enjoy the city and to give yourself a life. Um, I think that something that people always forget is that, God, I think even Patricia on Southern Charm was saying this the other day too. And it's so true. And I've never agreed with anything she's ever said. But having a life is very attractive to another person. And I understand that with like moving to New York and your boyfriend following you and stuff like that, you probably haven't had a ton of time to really crunch around and like get to know yourself and like find something to do. And I think it would be really cool if you maybe spend a couple nights of the week out of the house, not with your coworkers. I will also warn you against getting overly close with your coworkers because this is, you know, a job that hopefully you want to keep and, you know, sometimes befriending coworkers can become a little bit too incestuous. It blurs line it blurs lines at the office in terms of professionalism and everything else. Um, maybe find out if you can take a class. Like maybe find out if there's like some place that you can just spend a couple nights a week. Like go to THNK 1994, like that museum. Um, see if like Matt and Viviana will give you like an internship or something. I would absolutely try and find a way to spend a couple nights of the house out of the couple nights of the week out of the house so that he will do the same for you and propose this to him and say like, listen, how do we get to have our individual space and our alone time in a cramped New York City apartment? Now, I have a friend who, um, you know, she's ending her marriage. And when I went to her place in New York, I looked at her and I said, you lived here with like a man? And she was like, yeah. And I was like, how did you last as long as you did? And she was like, oh, I don't know. Like, I was like, girl, like, this is adorable for one person. For two people, this is fucking hell. And like, her place is adorable. But I actually would kill a man. I would kill a man. And that's because it's not just like, you know, it's not just like, you know, pasta dinners and, you know, catching up after work and, and watching the same TV shows. No, like, most couples have separate interests. And I would recommend getting a pair of nice wireless headphones that work with your television or whatever so that you guys can have your nights watching your own TV. I would recommend, you know, splitting up the space that you do have into small, separate living space feeling things. So maybe you only have a room and a half. Maybe you only have like a galley kitchen and a bedroom and you can't, you don't have separate rooms. Well, make it feel like separate rooms. Like, Maybe, you know, there can be a small computer desk or a small desk where you guys can, you can do like, you know, whatever. Like if you fucking bead necklaces or if you play The Sims, like you can do that in that room and then he can have wireless headphones on in the bedroom and watch his TV show, you know, or you can, you know, you can be in the room playing with your clothes or watching TV or watching a movie or whatever else. And he can be in the living room doing or the, you know, the fake living room doing his thing. Try and divide up the apartment as many creative ways as you can um, before before um, I do find also 
this is something that's just, I'm kind of scrambling here because I'm having so many thoughts and I'm trying not to just land on the one that I think that my heart is always leads me to, which is like, it's just not going to work. Um, because I, you know, not, and I'm not, I don't even say that cynically. I say that with like quite a lot of hope actually, because I do think that there's something quite refreshing in recognizing that something's not going to work and moving on from it. Um, not trying to make fetch happen, so to say. Uh, so I just like, I'm trying to think of like little ways that you can make your space a little bit more easy for you. One thing I remember when I got my first apartment after college uh, in LA was that I kept like putting stuff in my bedroom when I was unpacking. And my mom came out here to like help me set up my first apartment. Um, And she was out here for a while too. I think she's out here for like a week and a half. And, you know, I'm her baby and like, you know, she, my mom is like a home, she's a home person. Like she has always worked and does work, but she also was like a master at putting together a home. And so to have her there was great. And she noticed that I kept putting things in my room. Like I just kept like office things and like anything else. I kept putting it in my room. My mom was like, Molly, like you're doing the thing that people do when they get out of college that they don't realize they don't have to do anymore, which is like, you don't have to be confined to your bedroom. You have a whole house. So, and it was, it was just a one bedroom apartment, but she's like, you know, your kitchen things go in the kitchen. Now your office things, you you can have a living room space. You don't have to hoard your DVDs in your bedroom. You can spread things out a little bit, put in shelving. You know, these things don't all have to like be in a cluster with you. It's not all your stuff in one spot. So I will say maybe look at your place and look at ways that you might be living overly conventionally and or what you're used to from your space and past and say, what can I do that's creative that's going to make this feel like it has different space? Put in a beaded curtain if you need to between the kitchen and the bedroom. Think of different ways that you can make your space something new. But I would say that this needs to start with a conversation with him that's just like, babe, do you miss your alone time ever? Because I miss my alone time. And it is one thing that I've talked about in the past, which is why, you know, homes have doors and walls for a reason. People need their private space. Um, And that's something that oftentimes a New York City apartment does not allow you the luxury of. And if I were you, I absolutely would, you know, say to him, like, we're living in close quarters. It's unconventional. It's new to both of us. Previously, we both had sort of a little bit more space even if you live with roommates, like you and your roommates weren't up each other's asses all the time because you weren't in a romantic relationship. And I think in order for your relationship to be functional, you need to figure out a way to just say like, I'm still me and you're still you. And this is who we are together, but we don't have to be together all the time. So when do we figure out the me time and the you time? And that's where ducking out of the apartment for a few hours, making sure, you know, one thing that I always did when I lived with someone was, On Saturday mornings, come hell or high water, I was up early in the morning and I was out of the house and I would go to Starbucks and I would go to the Goodwill and I would look for things to like gussy up the house and I would dig for clothing and find cute things to wear to work and things that I could cut up and make into something new and um, really like kind of relishing in my brokenness and trying to make the most of it. Um, That was something I did that worked for me, especially in LA because I had a a, a slightly larger apartment than... um, I was used to and I was able to make it really my own space. Think about things like that for yourself. What can you do to make your home even more comfortable for you, feel more dynamic spatially, but also, you know, can you have this conversation with your boyfriend? And that is another point that I want to make is that anytime I've been afraid to have a conversation with someone that's like, hey, like, what can we do to make us both more comfortable? And I was afraid to have that conversation. It was a bad bad motherfucking sign. Like it's a bad sign if you are uncomfortable broaching a topic of conversation with someone like that, because that is a, that is a sane conversation. It's a healthy conversation. It's something that should already be in both parties' minds. Um, you know, I would be very concerned, um, you know, one thing I would say if he came at me with the rapper, One thing I would say is, what is this really about? Because if you want me to be better at throwing away my wrappers, I'll throw away my wrappers. Or maybe you can understand that I don't always throw away my wrappers, but you can toss it in the trash yourself 
and not be passive aggressive about it. Or, um, you know, you can just leave it there. You can find it in your heart to leave a granola bar wrapper out for a couple hours. I'll see it and I'll be more mindful of it. And that's your job. You have to be more mindful of not doing the thing. Now, I'm sure he has things too. And I didn't hear about really any imperfections of his other than he just kind of like leans over you and asks these questions. But I'm sure that you are ignoring things all the time that are really annoying to you or that are compromises for you. And women, we tend to feel compromised less. Um, Compromise comes easier to us. We are typically people that like things to just be okay. And not in a way that men are where they're like, men are fixers. And like, that's why they're always fucking up your ass over something uh, when you're like, I'm just trying to vent. And they're like, how do I fix it? And you're like, I don't need you to fix it. Just shut up. Let me talk. Um, Women are, they tend to avoid conflict like that and want to make things easier. So what is he doing? Can you think of a couple of things that he's doing that are driving you nuts? Because that needs to get brought to the table too. You need to say like, listen, we're, I love you. This is so like normal. Everyone I've ever heard talk about this talks about the same thing, which is that when you move in with someone you love, there's going to be compromise and there's going to be finding out new things about each other. And it doesn't mean we didn't know each other. And it doesn't mean we don't love each other or that this isn't going to work. It just means that we're getting to know each other on a realer level. And I know that me leaving wrappers out drives you nuts. Sometimes when you, you know, don't wipe down the floor after you shower, that drives me nuts because then I walk in there with my socks on and my socks get wet. There's something that you can, there's something that he's doing that you're not saying that you need to bring to him, not in sort of like a battle cry way. Like, you know, while you do this, you need to just say like, listen, how do we, how do we accept each other's differences in a way that's not going to be a huge compromise for us? How do we allow alone time? And if you can't have this conversation with him, you really need to think about where this is going to go in the long run. Now, I know that it would be incredibly inconvenient for you to break your lease. Um, however, I'm sure your lease is coming up. You did say last summer. So, you know, hopefully your lease is coming up sooner rather than later. If this feels like something, you know, you're not going to be able to work on. It does seem like you're more motivated than him. You were there first. I'm not worried about you and your future in New York. I'm sure that you'd be able to sublet a room or something else. But this conversation is really basic. And hearing you like hand ring about it kind of makes me feel like he might be controlling or that you're in a situation that's not completely comfortable for you. And that really bums me out because you deserve that. You deserve to have comfort in your living space. And you deserve to not be like at the hands of someone else, especially when you kind of are the mover and shaker in this relationship. You are the person that kind of made the first move. That was the same as my relationship. I knew I was coming to L.A., He was like, yeah, I'll go to L.A. too. But like he wasn't ever going to leave home if I wasn't going to L.A. Um, And that, you know, was something that got brought up years later. He reached out to me and said, like, no one ever asked me what I was going to do with my life before you. Thank you for, like, doing something with your life. So I was inspired to do something with mine. Um, And that's, you know, not to pat myself on the back. It's just to say that, like, that's the difference in two types of people. There are people that are constantly thinking about how they can chase their dreams and propel themselves into the next level of life. And there's people who are a little bit more like, nah, you know, I'm worried about the rapper. Um, I don't know, girl, please call us back 323-450-7408. I would love to get an update from you. And more than that, I think that this is something that, you know, maybe in a month or two, depending on where you guys are, maybe we can have a phone call on the show and just speak live because I would rather... I want to talk to you and hear like more about what the situation is like, more about the rhythms of the home. Um, It's a lot. I want to remind you just if I could say one thing to young malls, it's not your job to fulfill any sort of traditional gender roles in the home. I definitely felt like it was my responsibility to be working on what was for dinner that night, you know, and um you know, I was always the one who was like tidying up and like doing like little things to make the house look cuter. Um, that was always all on me. Um, and to the point that it was like, it wasn't something that was making me happy. You know, it wasn't making me happy to make dinner, um, tidying up the apartment or making the apartment look cute with like little, you know, upgrades or whatever. That was a pleasure for me because then I got to enjoy it. But at a certain point, it started to feel like I'm doing this for him. I'm trying to make this nice for him. If you make this nice for you, that's different. But just remember that 
you guys are both young adults that are figuring out the rest of your life. It's not your job to bear the brunt of this. It's not your job to figure this out alone. If these things aren't bothering him and he's just okay, like, okay, being like, you know what? Yeah, we're together too much. We're overcrowded. Um, I'm going to be passive aggressive. Maybe this isn't the person for you. I don't know. Let's talk. 323-450-7408. Call us back and maybe in like a month or two, depending on where you're at, we can um, have more of a conversation. All right. Thanks, doll. I'm going to read a letter. So strap in because I don't think I'm good at reading. Okay. The letter says, hey, Molly, loving the podcast. Thanks for teaching me the quote, that's not my journey phrase. As a liberal feminist atheist in the South, I'll get a lot of use out of it. But we aren't here for me to lament the social failings of Southerners. I'm hoping you can give my friend some good advice. She's the most indecisive person I know. I hate that. That's a, a, a side by me. If you give her a choice of two restaurants, she will list the pros and cons of both, try and make you choose. And then finally, after what seems like an eternity, we'll settle on one, but keep the other one on the table as backup. But when she knows what she wants, she wants it exactly her way. No meal is ever ordered without her alterations to it. This is relevant, I promise. And now she's at her biggest crossroads yet. She's of a particular religious group that isn't largely represented where we live. And she's decided that she wants to marry a guy from the same religion. I wonder what it is. Jehovah's Witness or Mormon, I bet. She was a member of Young Professionals Group for this kind of religion to try and meet men and only met married couples. She tried online dating twice. First time she dated a handful of guys and they all fizzled out. A few months later, she tried again and one guy stuck around. From day one, she's had an issue with his job, his intellect, and her, and her overall enthusiasm for him. Let's break this down. Job. She's in the science field. He was unemployed when they met and now works a job that will cap his salary no matter how long he works in that industry at 50K. She makes at least three times that right now. She struggles with the idea that she will always be the breadwinner. She hoped one day to leave her job and take a lower paying one to work with kids, but now she doesn't think that's possible. Intellect. He's not as bright as her. For example, he was surprised to learn that people spend more time with coworkers than friends or family. And after several months of dating, he was surprised to learn that she was taller than him. Her enthusiasm. I've never heard her talk about him with more than a meh attitude. When I ask why she's with him, she says he's a really nice guy. She admits to finding him attractive, but only when you ask her. She also doesn't think she's the most touchy-feely type who would be gushing with love for her beau. She's in her early 30s, and she and her boyfriend are deciding whether or not to move in together. They've been dating for more than a year. He wants to move in, but she's undecided and has been for the last three months. She said repeatedly she wants kids, lots of them, and soon. She thinks if she breaks up with this guy, it'll delay her having kids for another year. She worked out how long she thinks dating, engagement, and pregnancy will take if she starts over. So the question is, should she have him move in with her? She owns a house, and he runs. Please advise. P.S. I have given her my opinion as of other friends and family. Maybe yours will help her make up my mind. I'll support you know, thank you for writing in Tiff. You know, I, um, I mean, everything you said says that this girl is settling and I have to be honest, like, would her God want that? Like, I don't know what religion she is, but you know, marriages in almost all religions are meant to go the distance, um, even in not religion. The idea of marriage is that this thing is the thing that's going to last, right? Especially if you plan on bringing kids into the world. I personally think that it's very, very selfish to have children with someone that you are not crazy about. Um, now, there's plenty of people that will disagree with that. There's things like arranged marriages and things where people kind of grow into loving each other. Maybe they didn't start out loving their partner as much as they wanted, but they do love them very much. Um, there's also different types of love. There's romantic love. There's like companionate love. There's just, I don't know, like love. Um, but not everyone has to be head over heels in love with someone that they marry. But that said, um, there are a lot of things here that are ringing some major alarms for me. Now I'm talking like lifestyle stuff. So for example, if she... You know, I know for me, one thing that is important in finding someone who is a decent earner or is at least someone that would be willing to work with me to make sure that this is possible in terms of just like, you know, whether whether there's cutbacks or whatever else. If I ever have a child, I want to spend the first year or year or two of its life not working. I want to be with that child. I don't love the idea of having a kid and having to head back to work. But it doesn't seem like these two are going to be able to live the lifestyle that she wants and that she desires if that was to happen. Um, she would be back at work right away, which at that point, then what's the point of having three kids? 
um, if you're not going to spend time with them. Now, that's very Dr. Laura of me, but, and I'm not saying that she, you know, shouldn't want to work or that that's not appropriate for women to go back to work after they have kids. Of course it is. Um, that for a lot of people, that's not really an option. Um, and for a lot of people, it's also not really their desire, but I do think it's very weird to say you want three kids and then to not be around them. Um, the amount of money that he's earning is, you know, it's livable for a lot of places in this country. I don't really know where you live, but 50 K is, a livable salary for a lot of people. Um, you know, you own a, she owns a house. I would also say like, these are things that some of the things that are like, one thing I fear as a homeowner is that I'm more attractive to certain guys because I have this nest egg. I have this literal nest. I have this place that I own, you know, not outright. Of course I still have a mortgage and shit, but like I have some sort of security. I have an asset. Um, and I do worry, you know, that having this asset has almost come, become a liability because, you know, maybe some of these guys I've dated aren't that into me. They're into like the sense of security that I bring in a city that's very insecure. Um, I would be worried about that. I think some of these, th- these things are really weird. I think him not realizing that she's taller than him, for example, is strange. I think... I don't know, man. Like for everything you told me, I feel like there's a lot missing here. I feel like, you know, her not admitting that she finds him attractive until you drag it out of him. Like, well, why are you asking him? Why are you asking her if she finds him attractive to begin with? Like, isn't that kind of a no duh? Like if they're fucking like, obviously she's attracted to him, right? There's something maybe he's not like your idea of a looker. But like, are you saying that he's ugly? Are you saying that his personality is kind of shitty? I don't know. I mean, this sounds like she's operating out of fear to me. The fact that she's done this math on whether or not, you know, what this is going to take for her to do to have a turnaround if she breaks up with this guy sounds all like this doesn't sound sustainable to me. Um, But, you know, at the same time, the way that you spoke about your friend kind of makes me feel like she's a little bit of a dud herself and that she's going to paint herself into a corner no matter what. I mean, she can't pick a restaurant like you trust a person who can't pick a restaurant trusts herself enough to pick a husband. And that's really strange. Um, especially if he's not meeting so many of the marks, this is also a person who, when she finds something that she likes, like a salad, she knows no fava beans, add extra sprouts, no cherry tomatoes, sub garbanzo beans. Like she seems to know all that, but like you, but I don't know, man. I don't know. This is a really weird situation. I feel really a little bit weird for everyone involved that you're writing this and not her. And I'm not slamming you for that. I'm just saying that like this is. It's weird. It's weird that. You're so involved and so concerned and she is just trying to get something done. It's this is a huge decision. I mean, honestly, my friendship would be affected with someone if they were like this. Because one, I really, I really dislike selfishness regarding children. I really do. I think that rushing to have kids with someone that you're just meh about is really, really unfair to them. Um, And like, does it sound like this relationship's going to go the distance? No, it doesn't. But I mean, she could probably get pregnant and have some kids. It sounds like she has enough money to do so on her own. Like that's a decent amount of money. You know, she get a babysitter. Um, But I don't know. I'm the religion aspect. I don't really understand the parameters of this religion. I don't understand necessarily why I can imagine maybe, you know, if there's a dating site for it could be Judaism. It could be anything. It could be there's like, you know, much less Jews in the South than there are up North. Um, I mean, I would really suggest to her that if she, if her priority is marrying someone of her religion, that she moves to the spot where there's the most people of that religion, whether that be Salt Lake City or New York City or wherever. Like, she needs to move to where there's an abundance of people who practice the religion she practices. Because if that is her main thing, if that's her big catch, then yeah. Like, what is she doing? Of course, she's not going to find what she wants on the timeline. She wants it. That's a lot. That's a tall order. The tall order. Um, So tall, he might not even realize it's taller than him for several months. I don't know, girl. I'm uncomfortable with this whole scenario. And I think that. 
I don't know. I feel like I have to say, though, I feel like the fact that she's not even asking me this question, you are speaks volumes about everything. It makes me feel like I don't care if she doesn't care enough about herself to figure this out. Then why do I care? And frankly, why do you care? You probably have bigger things to work on in your life than this. Like, go fix not saying that there's anything wrong with your life. I'm saying go do something nice for yourself today. You don't need to worry about this. This is her life. And, you know, Tiffany got to do Tiffany. Whatever this girl has to do can go do her. But you know what? It's not your journey, Tiffany. It's not your journey. Um, I have nothing else to say on this. Call me back 323-450-7408. If you want to clarify some stuff, if you want to tell us off the record what the religion is so maybe I can get some more context, if you want to you know, tell me why the religion is so important, why it's an unmovable thing for her. Um, you know, maybe there are certain religions where it's just, you know, you can't, you just can't. Um, but is there some sort of parental influence? Is there a re- is her family dying off? Is she 45? Like what? I don't know what's going on. So um, until then, it's not your journey, Tiffany. And um, your friend sounds like she's kind of fucking herself over. So, Yeah. I'm going to take one last call and then we're going to wrap this show up, baby. Molly, this is Trisha from Santa Cruz, California, and I love you guys and Christina and Wags. So I wanted to, two things, mention Love After Lockup is a new show and it's sort of like crack. I binge watched it. I think because you like polyamorous married and dating that you will find this show intriguing. Um, It's about love after, uh, you know, a prison sentence. (laughs) Anyway, um, it's hilarious. So if anybody wants to check that out, I highly recommend. Second, I wanted to get your take on Southern Charm. I don't know if you've talked about the new season yet, but what is your take on Ashley, which is Thomas's new girlfriend? I used to live in Santa Barbara, so I knew of her, and she was a waitress at a restaurant, and then she was kind of out in the same club scene, so I know of her. She's stunning, of course, and I don't know. I just wanted to see what you think of her. I know you love Catherine. Uh, I love Catherine, too. Um, Anyway, that's it. I love you so much. Bye. Hey, okay, thank you for calling in with this. Just so you know, I do have a podcast about reality TV called Emotionally Broken Psychos where I haven't really gotten into Southern Charm this season, but there is so much, baby. I love this show. Um, I first want to say that, like, yes, I am aware of all the sexual assault allegations that Thomas Ravenel's up against. Um, even if our caller is not aware of them, I just want to say that I am aware of them. So I just want our audience to know that because sometimes people tend to tell me things retroactively and I realize I should have acknowledged that I do, I do know about this um, and that they're a, a deplorable and a, a just appalling. And frankly, um, Thomas Ravenel has ruined enough things for enough people and he better not ruin my stories. Um, th- those poor women, those poor women. Um, let me talk to you about Ashley. Take a drag of my cig first. Yeah, I smoke when I'm sick. I never stop. It's an addiction. Um, Okay, so this is what I think with Ashley. I think that she didn't get the memo. I don't understand a woman of her age, especially where, you know, she's not old by any means, but I think she is like 36 or 37, and she does want to get married and have kids. That seems to be her main priority. Um... I don't understand a woman like that going for Thomas Ravenel. Now, I do understand that Thomas Ravenel will put a kid in you and you'll get paid out for that. Um, I also have seen Catherine deal with it, and it seems like a very lackluster situation. This isn't exactly a stand-up guy that's going to put a kid in you. Um, This is a very problematic older man with a long history of drug abuse and um, just... uh, you know, a sexual assault and a variety of issues. The way he's treated Catherine is terrible. Now, I'm not an Ashley fan for a variety of reasons. One, I do see she comes from my friend Catherine. Um, Catherine's not really my friend, just in case people are curious, but uh, I call her that. Um, I do see she comes from my friend Catherine. I do think that there is something very disrespectful um, about kind of the way that she discusses the children with Catherine. I think that like talking to a mother of a child, especially a mother of a child that is, you know, she's had to work really hard to have any sort of relationship with her kids. And I think that kind of like, you know, haphazardly talking about it with her is um, 
you know, very harmful. And I think Ashley knows what she's doing. Um, I think that it's very um, tricky to bring a new parent type figure into a situation like that. And I don't trust someone like Thomas to do it well. Um, and it concerns me because I feel like these kids have had enough turmoil in their young lives, um, in their developmental years that they don't really need a new kind of semi parent stepping in for what seems like it's not going to be very long. Um, I'm not a fan of hers. I think that she is the wrong kind of opportunist and that like, she's just kind of dumb about it. Um, that if it wouldn't be that if she was like so smart at like, you know, manipulating people or something that. I would really respect her, but it's just like, girl, to what end? Like, what is the point of this? Um, You know, everyone at this point, by the end of this episode, if you don't listen to the rest of this, the episodes, I mean, you know that I'm very like particular about the way that people are with their kids um, and spending time with them and, and showing them love and treating them in the most healthy way possible. And so that's really my main concern. When it comes to Ashley, I don't really think much of her, except that I think that she probably thinks she's smarter than she is. Um, She is naive to think that she has tamed the beast that is Thomas Ravenel. Um, I think that she is wasting some good years of her life. And I think that she's also throwing herself in front of a reality TV camera during a very tender phase in her life, too, where it's like, you know, this is going to hurt your chances of potentially meeting a really great guy if this doesn't work out. I mean, the fact is, is that not a lot of great guys are super attracted to women who've been in messy reality TV situations, Um, especially when it comes to like someone moving across the country for Thomas Ravenel. Like that just doesn't it doesn't play well. Um, We see people have a harder time coming off the bachelorette trying to find regular relationships. So um, I don't know. Not a huge fan of Ashley. Um, I wish her well. I really don't wish harm upon any other woman. But I really I hope that she sees her showing this far on this season and what it looks like her showing will continue to be and that she, you know, takes notes and and moves on respectfully either away from the relationship or in a way that's going to be more respectful to the mother of the children, the guy she's dating. It's just too important to these uh that these young kids have a chance, you know? Um, you guys, thank you so much for listening to Please Advise. I'm Malls. Um, I'm not sure what number episode this is, but if it is a number, that's it. I love you guys so much. Thank you for listening. You guys, 323-450-7408. You can always call our phone and leave messages. In fact, that's how our show is made. 323-450-7408. Always call and leave voicemails because that's how we make our show you can also email us at askpleaseadvise at gmail.com with your questions or your voice notes the voice notes sound really crispy so if you just go into the voice memos part of your phone leave a little voicemail especially for you more long-winded folks um that might be the way to go um and thank you so much you guys thanks for being patient with me while i am getting better i'm recuperating i actually feel a lot better today and i think it's because i didn't push myself too much this weekend um and I also got to spend some time with you guys, like always listening to your voicemails and reading your letters makes me feel a lot better. So thank you. And Christina, thank you for being the best friend, best producer and making it possible for me to record this episode from my bed. All right. Wags, you have anything to say? All right. We love you. Talk to you soon. Bye bye.